Hello, I'm Chris Gatesy, Academic Director of the Jacobs Levy Equity Management Center for Quantitative Financial Research at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Today with us is the 2016 recipient of the Wharton Jacobs Levy uh, Prize for Quantitative Financial Innovation, William Sharp, a Professor of Finance Emeritus at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. It's impossible to engage uh, with the theory or practice of quantitative finance without a fundamental understanding of Bill Sharp's work and influence. More than 50 years ago, he published the groundbreaking work formulating the capital asset pricing model, or as it's known, CAPM. This breakthrough in financial analysis underlies the construction of any asset to be included in an investor's portfolio by allowing a comparison of systematic risk versus expected return. Later, Bill would amplify the key role of quantitative finance in investment decision making by modeling returns based style analysis. This allows sophisticated deconstruction of the returns of various investment strategies uh, and it became a key tool for money managers, investment allocators, consultants and so on as understanding grew that asset allocation is the primary driver of a portfolio's risk and ultimately return. In addition to his groundbreaking theoretical work, Bill has had a long and honored career as a teacher, as a thought leader, uh, as a practitioner and mentor to countless scholars and professionals. His status in the economic profession was recognized by the award of the Nobel Prize, one of the great uh, uh, many accolades that Bill has garnered over the years. We're delighted today to further honor Bill Sharp, whose intellectual influence in finance has never been greater. Bill, thanks for joining us and congratulations on this most recent accolade. Thank you very much and it is an honor indeed. I'm very appreciative. Bill, let me first ask you about the topic of style analysis, for which you're being recognized as progenitor uh, at our Jacobs Levy Center Spring Forum. It's a topic that every student of investment management, nearly every uh, institutional consultant or financial advisor, pension trustee, and fiduciaries of all variety know well. In fact, I just taught about it today back on campus at Wharton. Uh, it's now become a ubiquitous technology in the profession. Can you describe it for us and discuss how you came up with your uh, treatment of it? Well, the question came early on. You've got this fund. It's got, say, 80 outside managers. Each of the outside managers has 60 or 70 or 100 securities. How do you get your arms around it and make some sense out of what it is, how it's done in some sense or another, and what perhaps they ought to do differently? And it was pretty clear from the outset we were not going to be able to look into each of the sub-managed funds, see what securities were there, and then make some sort of totality out of it. We had to have some simple way, relatively simple way, to deal with this. And so, so my first thought was, well, that's fine. I'll do a factor model. You know, we, we knew about factor models where the return on something is composed of its exposures to some major factors and then how do the factors do. And so I, I and many others had worked in that area, so-called multi-factor models. So, so that would be the, the, the structure we would use. And then the question was how are we going to figure out what the fund's exposure was to say large value stocks, to small growth stocks, whatever it might be. You know, we needed to identify a relatively small number of factors and then figure out how to estimate exposures. And um, so the natural idea was, well, we'll use regression analysis. You regress the return on the fund or the sub-fund on the returns on these asset classes and see what you get, and there you are. Um, and we did, and the result was garbage. I mean, say, well, oh, that manager is 180% invested in large growth stocks, minus 30% invested in long-term bonds or whatever. It was just, it made no sense. So that was kind of depressing. <laughs> so we thought, well, uh, what can we do? Well, I thought, well, we know that those exposures have to add to 100%. So we'll, we tried regression. We had a lot of data to work with. We tried regression with constraint that the sum of the exposures had to add to 100%. And the result was slightly less garbage-like, but only slightly. Uh, so that was even more depressing. And then I thought, well, 
I know about this thing called quadratic programming, where you try to minimize a function which is a quadratic function, subject to some constraints. We use it in portfolio theory and portfolio analysis, and I'd even written an algorithm or two. So, you know, and we generally know that that manager doesn't have any short positions. And we know that manager doesn't have more than 100% invested in any asset class. So let's convert the task from regression analysis to quadratic programming. Try to find a set of factor exposures which sum to 100%, meet the constraints, and minimize and, and the objective of the mathematical exercise was to get it to fit as well as possible, let's put it that way and it turned out to be a quadratic programming problem. And voila, it worked. We got results that were really sensible, and the results explained the particular returns of the manager in question very well. And then we could aggregate them and do all the things we'd, we'd hoped to do using this kind of factor approach. So, so the, uh, the insight, which I certainly hadn't anticipated, was using quadratic programming to solve the problem, if you will, of representing each piece rather than regression analysis. And again, it wasn't even feasible for us to go down to the individual security by security level. So that was really the genesis. You've weighed in elsewhere on the smart beta, let's call it a debate. Uh, what's your view today? So just terminologically, when you say, I've got a smart beta, uh, it, what they're talking about is not beta, but it's factor loadings. It's a factor tilt. And for years, we call that kind of strategy a factor tilt. I'll tilt towards growth. I'll tilt towards value. I'll tilt whatever. So that's one level on which I object to the term. Uh, but more importantly, you know, the idea that it's smart to tilt away from the market proportions or the market exposures towards value or towards small growth or whatever it may be um, just bothers me from when I think about equilibrium. You know, if it's smart, if you say it's smart to underweight, I don't know, large cap stocks and overweight small cap stocks and that's better for everybody. And, and some smart beta proponents will basically say such things. Then that means that you and all the people who invest in your fund are smart. And I and all my friends who invest in index funds, broad market index funds, are dumb. And the people who are on the other side of your emphases are really stupid. <laughs> you know, I've said for longer, for many years, since. 1970, I guess, that ways to, quote, beat the market carry the seeds of their own destruction. I mean, either they, even if they worked well in the past, the probability they will work for an extended time in the future uh, is likely to be small. It's estimated that something like two-thirds of total invested U.S. assets in the U.S. are held in retirement plans. Uh, of that amount, more than $20 trillion, by the way, about six of it is in uh, defined contribution plans like 401k plans, where participants, ordinary Americans, uh, make their own investment choices. Uh, and the share of self-directed plans are obviously uh, growing uh, and appear not to be abating in their growth rates. The long-term trend is uh, taking money out of the hands of pension plan managers, BD plan managers, for example, and leaving it to Joe and Jane investor to do the best they can. From a policy perspective, does it make sense to rely on uh, ordinary Americans, uh, or to burden them, or, or, or to allow them, or, or to support them managing their own money? I think what we know is the average person saving through a 401k plan or on their own really doesn't know enough to make sensible decisions unaided in some way. Now, you know, you can say, well, put your money in, I don't know, tips and a broad world bond stock portfolio, and then all you have to worry about is how much risk you're going to take. And that's, that's, by the way, not bad advice, I would say. But even then, having some sense of the risk-return trade-off 
and what that means for how you might live in retirement. Uh, that's, that's hard. And so there are various advisors and advisory firms um, that try to help people make their accumulation decisions, allocate their funds in the 401k plan <coughs> or in a, DPE plan, a DC plan. Uh, and I think that's very important, extremely important. Um, when it comes to the decumulation phase, uh, in some ways you can do, I suppose, more damage if, if you've just cashed out your 401k or at least put it in an IRA and you've got to decide where to put it and then you've got to decide not only how to invest it but how to spend it. You mentioned the 4% rule. Um, and so, again, I think people need help. The financial crisis that some suggest started in 2006 and 2007 and 2008 showed uh, that many professional investors, um, relative to their understanding of risk and their understanding of what might happen during a financial shock, was either deficient uh, or wrapped around um, a principal agent problem or adverse selection or a moral hazard. Uh, has Wall Street learned its lesson, in your view? Uh, are institutional risk management techniques significantly better than they were? The question is really, was this an event that you literally were convinced could not happen, or did you assign it a very small probability? And if the latter, uh, you are not demonstrably wrong in your predictions. Um, so it gets, it gets sort of dicey, um, but I think realistically, there were plenty of people on Wall Street and plenty of their investors, people who invested in funds run by professionals on Wall Street and elsewhere, who just had no notion that that could ever have happened. And that was either a fault of the investment managers in not educating their investors or uh, maybe possibly not educating themselves sufficiently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it happened, and uh, I think realistically, one has to assume it could happen again. Mm -hmm. How low is the probability? I have no notion. Uh, what's been your approach to doing your work? I generally do at least the better theoretical work sometime between midnight and four in the morning when I wake up, and there are no distractions whatsoever. I don't have a pad and by my bedside, and I don't turn on the light. I just lay there and I think and I think and, and uh, usually I manage to, you know, whatever I've been, that's been bedeviling me uh, becomes clear. I also write, I write programs. I write programs every single day of my life. I love programming. I was trained to think about a world in which you have people maximizing something, utility or, or profits or expected utility or expected profits and they come together in marketplaces and prices result out of an equilibrating process. And that's, that's what I was trained to do in microeconomics and I applied it to finance and it kind of worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you. <laughs> Bill Sharp, thank you for your time today. Again, congratulations on winning the Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize for uh, qu uh, quantitative financial innovation uh, this year in 2016. Well, thank you and thank you to the committee uh, who honored me with it. I'm very, very delighted.